following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Welcome to Meet the Author. My name is Della Kidd, and I'm here at the MTA studio with author Firuze Dumas. She'll be sharing her ideas about the writing process and talking about her amusing and insightful stories. Her book titles are Funny and Farsi, a memoir of growing up Iranian in America, and Laughing Without an Accent, Adventures of a Global Citizen. Firuze, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's going to be a lot of fun. For our viewers who have not yet read your stories, tell us a little bit about yourself and your books. Well, I came to America in 1972 from Abadan, Iran, and my books are a series of humorous vignettes about what it was like for us as immigrants in this new country. And I understand when I was reading uh, Funny and Farsi that there, when you arrived there were so many people who had no idea where Iran was, much less Abadan, Iran. No, we used yeah. to say, well, the, my name at the time was Firuze Jazuyeri. That's F-I-R-O-O-Z-E-H-J-A-Z-A-Y-E-R-I. It's a long name. It's a long name. <laughs> and you could definitely tell that we're from somewhere else. And so people were always asking us where we're from. And when we'd say Iran, they'd just say, where is that? Well, your stories are very funny. They're very poignant. They're also very personal. What sparked your interest in writing and uh, choosing to write about your own life experiences? Well, I have a father who's a storyteller. And so I grew up with this tradition of oral storytelling. But I've also been always somebody who thinks that everybody has a story to tell. And I have yet to meet somebody who doesn't have a story to tell, and so I just felt like I wanted to put out there what I went through, uh, mainly for my children, is, is why I started writing. But now, of course, others are reading the stories, too. And you mentioned that your, your dad is quite the storyteller. Absolutely. The funniest person I've ever known. Any if, favorites that you'd like to share? Well, I think that one, one of my favorites for my first book, Funny and Farsi, is the story about when he went on Bowling for Dollars. <laughs> uh, because we were absolutely sure that he was going to win. And, uh, bowling and so was he. He was sure, <laughs> yes. we were sure. And I don't know if, if, if any of you guys have ever experienced a huge disappointment. Mm -hmm. But I still remember that, uh, that night very well. So, Why do you think people of all cultures can relate to your stories? Because we're all outsiders. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can be born in America for, you know, three, four generations, mm -hmm. and everybody feels like an outsider at some point. You know, if you're tall, if you're short, if you have red hair, if you're not good at sports. Anything and that makes you different or an outlier. Anything makes you different, right, mm -hmm. right. Since you write about your life, all of your characters are real. How did your father, your mother, your extended family feel and react when they discovered that you were going to start documenting your life experiences? Well, and they were included in them. They didn't think that anybody mm -hmm. was going to read my stories. And so they were like, fine, write whatever you want. And then when the book, when my first book became a bestseller, uh, then of course they wanted, they came to me with suggestions for more stories. You know, <laughs> every, everybody wants to look good, right? They, they all like tell the me these stories line. where, you know, I'm the hero, yeah. but, you know, write that story. What about your husband and children? Are they ever bothered by what you have to say about them? Well, you know, I really don't write, write about my children. Is this a picture this of you This is my husband, husband Francois. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and I only write about my husband minimally because I try to respect his privacy uh, since I was not a writer when he married me. <laughs> so I also don't want to spring that on him. But my children, I don't really write about very much at all. So they're safe. Because otherwise, I think they would never talk to me. Oh, and you wouldn't want that. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. <laughs> I'm here today with author Firuze Dumas. This is a live presentation. And in just a few minutes, we're going to open up our phone lines to welcome your questions. Our number nationally is 1-800-231-6359. If you're calling us locally, you may reach us at 703-978-1636. Your father came to uh, the U.S. for the first time as a Fulbright Scholar, correct? Yes. Okay. What does the value of education mean to your family? It's everything. Mm -hmm. It is the most important thing. And you know, I have never met anybody who's regretted having an education. It's education mm -hmm. is something nobody can ever take it away from you. It's yours for life. And it, it's the most empowering thing there is. And yet sometimes we're so quick to take shortcuts to get through it. I, it is. And, and, yeah. I, and I think if you could only look at your life long term, yeah. 
we'd all mm -hmm. understand how important it is to have a good education. Well, I know someone that probably helped form formulate that as well as, of course, the, the family philosophy that you have is your second grade teacher, Mrs. Sandberg. Mrs. Sandberg. She sounds like she was very, very important to you as, as a teacher and as a friend. Yes, yes. Uh, tell me, she asked your dad to take you to the library because you love to read books so much. What role does the library today's internet connections play, particularly for children of parents who um, maybe don't speak English or English is not their first language? Well, we didn't have books in, in, in our mm -hmm. house because my family's not readers and we had textbooks. My father's an engineer mm -hmm. so we had lots of engineering textbooks but those aren't the kind of books that make you want to become mm -hmm. a reader. And so when Mrs. Sandberg told my father to take me to the library, that really changed my life because I remember, first of all, the first time I went to the library, I actually took my coin purse with me because I couldn't believe that there was a place that let you take books for free. I was sure that they were wrong. And so I took my coin purse with me the first time I went. And I went and I picked the smallest book in the library because I thought I had enough money for that. And so when, when I got the library card, I was amazed. I thought, who in the world thought of this? I get to take books home for free? I mean, there's nothing else in the world that's free. And that little, that little library card, you know, people always say to me, is there such a thing as a flying carpet? Yes, it's that library card. My goodness. So it's very important in my life. And I, I love libraries, I think for especially for, for children who, whose parents are not readers, mm -hmm. it's, it's, at, it's vital. We're going to stop there for a moment because we have a telephone call. Wonderful. Hi, tell us your name and what is your question today for Firoze? Uh, my name is Jonathan Beck and uh, my question is, uh, were you surprised by the negative and bigotry expressed by so many concerning the building of the Moss Community Center near Ground Zero? Was I... Um, was I surprised by the negativity around the uh, the, the Moss building of the Moss building? Well, yeah. you know, um, I was, especially because once I researched it a little bit, it turns out that it's not a mosque and it's not a ground zero. Uh, but I, yes, I was very, and I, and I still am very dismayed by um, just how much suspicion there is. Because f from what I've understood about it, their point um, was to actually build like a cultural center for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, sort of a, an, a place where, you know, they'd be making bridges. So yes, I definitely was uh, very disappointed. Thanks for calling. You mentioned that your father really regretted that his sister did not receive the education he believed that she, that she deserved. You also described that your mom was expected to marry rather than finish her education. Right. Why do you think so many countries still dismiss the importance of education for girls? Well, I'll tell you, it, it's, it's, it's a tragedy, but I think it, it just comes down to, to value. I mean, my father, for instance, always embedded in me this idea mm -hmm. that the most important thing for a girl is to be educated. And he always said, you know, you never want to have to depend on anybody. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought this was what every little girl was hearing from their father. Now, if I had grown up with a father who thought differently and he said, there's no point in you getting an mm -hmm. education, I wouldn't be who I am today. Mm -hmm. So Because your I father was highly educated. He was educated mm -hmm. and he also felt mm -hmm. that for girls, he, he even said to me, he said, you know, if I had to choose between edu educating my daughter or my son, I would educate my daughter because without it, a, a woman is completely at the mercy of others. Oh, my goodness, that was very forward thinking for you. Very dad. forward thinking. Absolutely. For a man from, you know, a small mm -hmm. Middle Eastern country, you certainly wouldn't mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't expect that. And this is a philosophy that was in the 70s, which is things have certainly evolved a little bit, but that was not the typical. Right. So I give my father yeah. a lot of credit. Yes. Well, let's talk about the writing process for a moment. Your books are referred to as memoirs. What would you say is the difference between a memoir and an autobiography? Well, I think a memoir are, are, is, is a collection of the mm -hmm. memories that you mm -hmm. want to share. So it's not necessarily, you know, I was born, you know. Right. Just telling yeah. the story. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's, you get mm -hmm. to pick and choose when you're writing your memoir. How did you begin to organize that memoir? Well, I didn't. I actually, um, the first story that I ever wrote was mm -hmm. about the first time I went to summer camp. Mm -hmm. And I started with that story only because I told it to my husband one night. And he was laughing so hard that he was crying. <laughs> and so I just wrote that story. And the way the process worked for me was that every time I would finish a story, another one would just pop in my head. It was kind of like when you go to a vending machine and you get a candy mm -hmm. bar and then another one pops up. Right. So I it's like I, a bonus. It's like a bonus. <laughs> yeah. And I felt like every story sort of led me to the mm -hmm. next story. And I also discovered that when I was writing, through the whole process of remembering, it was like going down a tunnel. The more I tried to remember, mm -hmm. the more I started remembering. You mentioned that your husband was laughing so hard he was crying. I was laughing out loud too as I was reading the books. Talk to us a little bit about the place in humor in your stories. Well, I actually did not start out with the intention of writing mm -hmm. a humorous book. And I was very surprised when my book was finished and I realized it was actually quite funny. 
I think that having just grown up with a father who mm -hmm. has a great sense of humor, that it was something I picked up without realizing. Mm -hmm. But humor is so important when you want to tell your story because it's, it actually breaks down barriers. It makes people feel very comfortable. Right. And my humor is very gentle. You know, there's a lot of times when people are actually very mean mm -hmm. and they disguise it as, oh, I'm just being funny. That's right. not funny. Mm -hmm. If you're hurting someone's feelings, that's not humor. Yeah. But when you use humor in, a, in that gentle way, it actually puts people at ease. Yeah, it is a universal language. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Um, you've said it's, it has been said that it's hard to do comedy, whether it's stand-up or writing comedy or skits or whatever. Is it hard to write humorous stories? You, d you write them so effectively. We do laugh out loud when we read them. If I were to try and write something funny, I'm not sure I would be able to do that. Is it hard? You know, I think it, it, it actually comes very easily to me, but then things, other things are very hard for me. Like, you would not want me on your basketball team. So, okay. and I know people who can <laughs> shoot baskets like it's a natural thing, not and, me. And they make it look easy, exactly. and so do you. <laughs> exactly. We have a caller. Tell us what right. is your name and what is your question today? Uh, I have a question. Uh, why did you come to the U.S.? You said she was born in Iran. Oh, why did we come here? Mm -hmm. uh, my father was an engineer with the National Iranian Oil Company, and he was given a two-year assignment to come to America to help uh, an American company mm -hmm. here build an oil, an oil company in Iran. Uh, so that's why we came here. Okay. Thank you for calling. Uh, there, are there times when humor gets lost in translation? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, my, when my first book was being translated into Persian, uh, you know, we'd run across problems like, how do you translate shake and bake? You know, everyone in America, especially in the 70s, mm -hmm. knows, you know, the, the lady standing with the drumstick in the bag, shaking it. Well, you can't translate that because it's just part of the culture right. here. Uh, or things like, come on down. In America, when anybody hears that, they know it's from the show Price is Right. Right, exactly. Well, when you translate that, it just says, come on down. It's, it's flat. <laughs> So there's just some things you really can't mm -hmm. translate. We were talking before we went on the air about getting published and the use of humor. Was it easy to get published? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. I, I had so many rejections. And what I was told over and over again is that in America, there's no place for Middle Eastern family mm -hmm. in humor. That I was told that if I wanted to get published, I should write about the struggle and the oppression. Mm -hmm. But I was not oppressed. So as I told my father, mm -hmm. I said, you ruined my career because, you know, there's a bigger market for oppression. But um, it was very hard, and it's one thing I always um, emphasize when I talk to students, because my successes are very public. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see my articles in the New York Times, or you hear me mm -hmm. on National Public Radio, what you don't see or hear about is all the, the other five stories that were rejected. And so I think it's very important to have that resilience if you decide to go into a creative field. Absolutely. We have another caller. Great. Hi, what is your name? What is your question? Caller, are you there? I want to know what inspired you to write about your life. What inspired you to write about your life? Well, I wanted my children to learn a very simple lesson that I had learned back when I was seven years old, mm -hmm. which was that our commonalities far outweigh our differences. And this was something I learned by just coming to this country and getting to know Americans and going to their houses and getting to know their families. And I discovered that the human experience is entirely universal and that families are families. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what language they're speaking or what food they're eating. We all have the same hopes and dreams. And when I became an adult, I started meeting grown-ups who didn't know that. And I met adults who are genuinely afraid of people who are from different countries or different religions mm -hmm. or different skin colors. So I just want to make sure that my kids learn this very simple lesson. So that, yeah. that was really what, what got me started. Okay, thank you. Thanks for calling. In some of your stories, and you, uh, you alluded to this a little bit before our caller, uh, uh, the come on down from Price is Right. Um, the language and culture, the American language, it can be confusing. The, some of the aspects, for instance, using elbow grease was an example you used in, in, in your book to remove a stain using elbow grease was very, very confusing term. Yeah. How easy or hard was it for you to assimilate culture from one culture to another versus the experience your parents had as they segued from one culture to another? Well, you know, I first came here when I was seven, mm -hmm. and seven-year-olds are like sponges. I mean, they just pick things up, uh, anything around them. My parents, if you met them today, you'd think they just came here last week. So for them, assimilation uh, was very difficult. And, you know, when you're a student and you go to school in America, you're surrounded by Americans, you're surrounded by the English language, mm -hmm. it's much easier to learn. Although English is really hard. I have to give credit to all the people here struggling it's to learn it. It's a complicated language. Now, we're looking at a picture of you and a friend. <laughs> Tell us about your, the, the, what the part of your assimilation was in changing. I believe you had at one point decided to change your name as well. I did. Yeah. Well, this is a picture of me my freshman year in high school with my friend Carolyn. We used to have something in our high school called Tourist Day because we lived in a beach town. 
And in the summer, our town was overrun mm -hmm. by tourists. So once a day, once a year in, in our school, we had tourist day where all the students would dress up as tourists. I, of course, would just go to my mom's closet and pick anything. <laughs> it was easy. Uh, it was very easy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that, that was part of, of my high school experience. Okay. Well, we have another call. Hi. What is your name and question? Uh, hi. My name is Speedy Foncha. Mm -hmm. And um, I was asking, what was your life like in Iran? What was your life like in Iran? Well, I'm actually from Abadan, which is a pretty small town mm -hmm. in the south. And in the southwest of Iran. You know, my life in Iran was very much like a life in America in a small town 30 years ago. It was, it was actually a very, very mm -hmm. nice life, and I have nothing but fond memories from it. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knew everybody. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually still friends with people that we knew back in Abadan, and we always talk about how nice life was there, how easy it was. Yeah. It's, that, it's that typical small town life. And you kept those, those family connections. We did. We yeah, kept the family wonderful. connections. Well, as someone who's managed to navigate through the subtle nuances of learning a new language, learning a new culture, what do you say to someone who is new to this country? Well, I would say, you know, just get out there and start meeting Americans. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to speak perfect English in order to begin speaking to Americans. I think a lot of times when people are learning English, they feel like they don't want to practice until they can speak fluently. And that's a big mm -hmm. mistake because yeah. you do have to, to stumble along and make mistakes. And it's okay. And I think that uh, there are a lot of very, very kind and helpful Americans, no matter where you live, who are so tolerant mm -hmm. and kind and patient with people who are learning English. So I would say find a couple of those and start practicing. Okay. Well, now on the flip side, what do you say to people like me who grew up in this country uh, don't have any idea what it's like to be from somewhere else? Well, you know, fortunately today there are so many books written by immigrants mm -hmm. from all over the world. So if you want to find out more, you can either go become an immigrant or you can read the books. Okay, so well, I guess I will take to read that. The books. <laughs> I'll take the advice. <laughs> <laughs> My guest, Firuze Dumas, writes about her introduction to American life. Shortly, we will open our phone lines. But first, let's take a short break to see how two intrepid young travelers maneuver their way through the often confusing maze of American culture. Hi, my name is Christian Madrina. And I'm Ryan McGeegan. And we're visiting the U.S. this summer from Limavati, Northern Ireland. It's been great fun, but sometimes I have to say the language and culture is a wee bit confusing. Take, for example. Yeah, they're going to do better this year. Hey, guys, what's hey. the crack? What's what? What's the what? What's the crack? You don't do, we don't drugs. do drugs. Where are you guys going? What did, what did I say? Where we come from, what's the crack means what's up or what's happening. Hey Ryan, there's your biscuit. Thanks. Well, what's this? That's, that's a biscuit. What's that? This is a cookie. I want one of those. But you asked for a biscuit. What? The cookie. Your cookies are our biscuits. Could I have a hot dog and some chips, please? Yeah, sure. There you go. What are these? These are chips and a hot dog. You know, these are crisps. Crisps? I mean chips, you know, with the potatoes. Oh, oh. Like these? That's chips. Come on, those are french fries. Those are chips. French fries. Chips. French fries. Chips. Fries. What you call french fries, we call chips. I'm bored. Well, what do you want to do? How about we play football? Good idea. Let's go get the football. All right. Hey, Chris, catch! What? What are you doing? I'm playing football. No, you're playing soccer. Soccer? 
So even though we speak English and you Americans speak English, there are some funny differences between our language and cultures. I've had fun learning about these differences. So long for now. Welcome back to Meet the Author. Our phone lines are open, so if you have a question for our author, Firuze Dumas, give us a call. Our number nationally is 1-800-231-6359. If you're calling us locally, you may reach us at 703-978-1636. Those boys from Ireland certainly show us that there are some funny differences among cultures. Even when you speak English. <laughs> <laughs> we have an email question from Katie that I'd like to throw to you. She writes, in laughing without an accent, you refer to yourself as a global citizen. What does that mean to you? Well, when I meet somebody, I don't <clears throat> think, well, they're going to be a certain way because they're from a certain country mm -hmm. or a certain religion. I judge every person just by their character. I mean, everybody starts out at zero for me. Mm -hmm. So I try not to have uh, basically stereotypes of what I think someone's going to be like. We have another email, and this is from Cameron. Cameron writes, your first time living in America <laughs> differed from your second time living mm -hmm. here. Can you explain the differences? Well, the first time we came here, Americans had actually never heard of Iran. And uh, so we spent a lot of time explaining that, no, we do not ride camels. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second time we came to America, um, it, the, the Iranian Revolution mm -hmm. happened, and a group of Americans were taken hostage in the American embassy in mm -hmm. Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there were bumper stickers everywhere and T-shirts that said, Iranians go home, and we play cowboys and Iranians. And there was just such a hatred for Iranians. Mm -hmm. And it was so strange for me, because I was 14 years old at the time, and I couldn't understand how, why people would so suddenly jump on this hatred bandwagon. Mm -hmm. And it really, I mean, I, th I think it's actually why I ended up becoming a writer. It was, it was because of that experience. Mm -hmm. It was experiencing one America and then a completely different America. Very, very different. Uh, you were speaking about uh, the, what was going on in history at the time. Mm -hmm. You were, um, you met Catherine Koeb, who was one of the women taken hostage during the 1979 Iranian hostage crisis. What did that experience mean to you? Well, actually, when there were 52 hostages mm -hmm. um, that were, who were held for 444 mm -hmm. days, and two of them were women, and mm -hmm. we used to watch the news every single night with my family, mm -hmm. just hoping to hear the news that they'd I been freed. I believe we all did. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was horrible to yeah. watch. And I remember both of the women were shown both Christmases, and, and I remembered one of them so well because she turned to the camera the second Christmas she was in captivity, and she said, Mom, by the way, my weight loss is intentional. And she left such an impression on me because I thought, wow, you know, she had her wits about her. Yeah. She certainly looked, she looked very courageous and she was funny. Mm -hmm. And so a few years ago, my brother told me that one of uh, his coworkers is related to this former hostage. So I got her email and we started an email exchange. And at first, I didn't even know if she would even answer my email because I thought maybe she never wants to hear right. from an Iranian again. But I, I did send her an email and she responded right away and, and we became friends. And then we ended up actually meeting. She lives in Iowa. And the most amazing thing about Catherine is that, that she said that when she was in Iran, because she's a practicing mm -hmm. Christian, she decided that she was not going to leave with hatred and resentment, that she was going to leave that behind, and that she was just going to see the humanity uh, in, in, in all the people that mm -hmm. she met. And to me, her ability to let go of that resentment was just amazing. And I think she's a model citizen for that. Quite a lesson learned. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would the world be like if more people let go of their resentments? Exactly. A much better place. Yeah. Okay, we have another caller. Okay. Hi, what is your name and your question, please? Hi, my name is Slade Ferris. What was your most heartbreaking experience when you were an immigrant in America? Well, I think without a doubt mm -hmm. was uh, seeing people put hateful bumper stickers on the car and seeing people wear T-shirts that said they hated Iranians. Mm -hmm. that, that was very painful for me. And I, and I, and I kept thinking to myself, uh, you know, what are these people thinking? Why would you wear a shirt that announces that you're hating an entire people? It, it, was, it, was, a, it was a very painful time in my life. What has it been like? Uh, thank you so much for calling. Um, living in a post-9-11 world as an Iranian American. Well, again, I mean, right, right now, mm -hmm. of course, uh, in, throughout the world, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, Middle Easterners are mm -hmm. under so much suspicion. And, and again, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's a tough time for everybody, not just Middle Easterners, but I think it's more, more necessary mm -hmm. than ever that we actually talk to one another. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's easy to hate people when you don't know them. And it's once you start getting to know somebody and you start seeing their humanity mm -hmm. is when you can put the news in, in perspective. Because we have to remember that news, only bad news is news. Right. There's never anything positive on the news about another country. And yet it doesn't so mean that report, everybody right. from my country, right. you know, is bad news. So I just, I, th I think this is a real time when we as citizens need to build bridges mm -hmm. and we just need to talk to one another. 
let's take another email question. This is from Brittany. She uh, has here, you write that you decided to get rid of the television from your home. Are you still TV free? And if so, do your, how do your teens handle it? <laughs> this is, I'm sure. We, well, we are, t we are TV free, but uh, do not worry about my children because now, you, first of all, we do rent movies. So okay. they've seen plenty of movies. And you know, now there's a lot of us shows on, on the computer as well. So they're, they're really not that deprived, so you don't need to feel sorry for them. And they also have a lot of friends who also did not grow up watching a lot of TV. And so they do, you know, they have their own social life based on non-TV things. So. We have, I, I'd, I'd love to hear you share some of the, the funny stories that you have. Do you have any favorites that you'd like to share with us today? Well, there were just so many, but yeah. I think a lot of them have to do with language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my father had learned English from British textbooks. And so he had assured us that knew, he knew how to speak English. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we came here, all of a sudden, we realized he actually didn't speak English. And it turns out that when you learn to speak English from a textbook, you learn to say, hi, how are you? And then you come here and people say, yo, what's up? So, mm -hmm. well, you know, what is that? And uh, he still, my father still calls me with questions about the English language. And I remember last year he called me one day and he said, what is the difference between knocked up and knocked down? <laughs> and I said, well, I've experienced both, and they're very different. And um, you also, your uncle, he, he, there was some the hilarious story about his effort to try and lose weight. Well, my uncle, by the way, who I have to add, is a slim man. And the only reason I wrote that story about him coming here and gaining weight and trying to lose weight is because that was just a very brief period in his life. I would not have written that story if he were somebody who was always struggling with weight, because it would have been really mean. Right. Um, but he you know, came to visit us in America, mm -hmm. and he just ate his way through this country. I mean, there was not a Baskin Robbins flavor that he didn't try. And more than was yummy. Everything, Everything was <laughs> yummy. And he and my dad were always going to the grocery store, mm -hmm. coming back with bags, and just bags of groceries, and opening things up, and you know, spraying weird cheeses on strange crackers, and heating up soups, and chilies, and cookies. And so he put on a lot of weight, and then he decided he was going to lose weight the American way which was to buy all these products he was seeing on TV. So that actually, that, that's probably one of the funnier stories in Funny and Farsi. Well, and what was so funny is he expected instant gratification. Well, which is what quickly. they say on the commercials, you know? though. Yeah. Yeah. See, well, when you, when you come to America and, and, and you see these commercials, <laughs> you think they're true. They're not true. They're not true at all. No. If only they were, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. You can't lose weight because of a pill. <laughs> what advice do you have for our aspiring writers out there who are watching today? Oh, I would say read, read, read. Because when you read, that's how actually you find your own voice. Mm -hmm. And there's so many great books out there. And I know these days kids have so many other temptations. Mm -hmm. There's a computer and iPods and all that. But my God, if you can put aside an hour mm -hmm. every day just to read for pleasure, mm -hmm. so many good books out there. And you will not regret it. Well, we certainly don't regret having you here today. It has been so well, much fun talking to you. thank you for having me. You. Thank my you pleasure. Thank you so much. You can learn more about author Firuze Dumas by visiting her website at www.firuzedumas.com. And to check out our upcoming authors and programs, visit us at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. Now, if you were saying, you told me that you kept up with family from Iran. What about your friendships from when you first moved to the United States? Oh, yeah, so friends kept up too. with those yeah. friendships as well? Yeah. I always say you can't get rid of them. So it's like, yeah, I stay in the system forever. <laughs> Are you still in contact with your teacher? Because I know she was so Stanford. instrumental. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She's now retired, living in Utah. But uh, we're still in touch. Good, because I'm.